There we are. There we are. Okay. So uh, this brings us to Romans 11, uh, Romans 9. Paul has, has argued that Israel's unbelief uh, was uh, appointed by uh, the Word, the purpose of God in Romans 10. Paul appeals to the Word to explain, to account for the influx of Gentiles into God's people. And we've also seen he hints at a connection between them. Israel's unbelief has become the occasion for Gentile uh, belief, and Gentile belief is intended, Romans 10, 19, to provoke Israel to jealousy. So that imagery of itself suggests that uh, the final word has not been spoken on Israel. So we have to go to Romans 11 to see what, what that would entail. Now, in, in Romans 11, 1, uh, Paul asks, God did not abandon his people. May it not be so. And then what Paul does is to show that in two parts. In, and this is a frequently cited designation, Romans 11, 1 to 10, the fall of Israel is not total. That is, there is, in Paul's words, a remnant chosen according to grace. Verse 5, Paul points to himself as an example. And in verses 11 to, uh, to 32, Paul insists that this, this rejection is not final. Uh, I say then, 11.11, they did not stumble so as to fall, may it not be so, but by their trespass, salvation has come to the nations to, to provoke them to jealousy. That verb, of course, is the same verb that Paul used in 10.19, and you see the sequence, uh, trespass, Gentile salvation, Israel jealousy. So that's, that's the sequence of thought. Now in 11.12, Paul says, if, if their trespass is riches for the world and their failure or lack is riches for the nations, how much more their fullness or full inclusion? We'll talk about that translation in a minute. So what's Paul saying here? The, the misstep, the transgression of Israel has brought spiritual riches to the world, to the Gentiles. Uh, we're taking Plutus, Plutus riches as spiritual riches because 2, 4, and 11, 33 to 36, riches, we've argued, is specifically the riches of divine mercy. So here Paul is, is restating the point that the transgression, the misstep of Israel has become the occasion in God's purpose for the spread of gospel mercies to all the nations. Now, what about the end of verse 12, how much more their pleroma? How much more their pleroma? And the word can, can be neutrally rendered fullness, But that is broad, and it, it can be broken down into to two options. One, we can say, is qualitative, full restoration, completeness. Or it can be quantitative, full number. And the, uh, the ESV has, has done something of a, of a bridge, the full inclusion, which I take to be a, a qualitative statement, the full 
uh, restoration, uh, full inclusion. Now, I think the, the qualitative sense is better, preferable, because <clears throat> the contrast is with two things, uh, transgression, trespass, and loss. Those are qualitative terms we would expect Paul to use a qualitative term here. Though, as, as John Murray says, the, the numerical cannot be suppressed. So, so the thought is the, the fullness quanti, quant, qualitatively of Israel. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> any fullness, as Paul is, is looking forward to the future, as, as we have stressed earlier, any, any fullness of Israel, would, would not be independently of individual Jews coming to faith in Christ through the gospel and becoming part of the church, the people of God. But the fact that there is now, verse 5, a remnant, lema, and Paul anticipates, verse 12, pleroma, fullness, suggests that Paul has in view uh, some kind of future in redemptive history, a positive future for Israel. Well, then the question is, well, how far into the future will this take place? And, and some have argued, in, in the critical literature especially, that, that Paul thought that that would happen in his own lifetime and through his own ministry. The problem with that view, though, is, is with what Paul says in verses 13 and 14. Uh, he says, I uh, speak uh, to the Gentiles inasmuch as I am apostle to the nations, to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If in some way I might provoke to jealousy the, uh, my flesh, literally, and save some of them. Oh, well, there's the word, provoke to jealousy, and that, that does seem to plug Paul into what he said in verse 11, uh, the provoking of unbelieving Israel to jealousy. But look at the outcome at the end of 14, that I might save some of them. So Paul does not say that he will be the one through whom the pleroma will be saved but he says, I will, through me, I will save some. So I think Paul is looking beyond his own ministry as he anticipates this future in verse 12. Yes? Uh, with regard to, I guess, uh, that I might save some, and then later as well, when, you know, all things to all men, that I might save some. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, the people, brothers with the more of an Arminian bent, I guess, have, have used that to say that, uh, so it is, it, it is <coughs> intellectual how would you, uh, I guess, speak to that mm -hmm. prior, in a conversation with someone who would hold to a more, a more Arminian belief, mm -hmm. denying reform, uh, soteriology? Yeah, I mean, could you, could you spell out uh, how they so, would see uh, the verse? Uh, so it is, not, it is not God who converts. It is uh, it's impressed upon the individual Christian mm -hmm. to actually speak into the lives. They have a responsibility for mm -hmm. the salvation of others. I mean, these I are see. all explicitly denying. Mm -hmm. Someone who is grieving that it, someone else's soul is their responsibility that mm -hmm. they convert. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, I, I've seen both, uh, you know, it became all things for all people that I might save some, and then as well, fear that, that I might save. Mm -hmm. you know, I see, um, yeah. I guess, how, how do you speak to that? Yeah. Well, you know, again, we, got, we have to remember what Luke says at Pisidian Antioch, which is the, the programmatic sermon for Paul's ministry in Acts, as many as were appointed for eternal life believed. So uh, any gospel endeavor I undertake, I can never do thinking that it is my words, my eloquence, that, that will bring them to salvation. So I, I, that, that is not a burden that God places on any, any man's shoulders. And, 
so what we do, I mean, that we do evangelize because we're confident God has his elect out there. Um, but I, I don't see any indication in the scripture that um, we're, Christians are to, to drop everything they do and go out and evangelize 24-7. I mean, for one thing, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. There were seasons in his ministry where he was making tents and he, he couldn't involve himself in gospel labor as, perhaps as much as he would like. So, you, you know, we're, we, we take up this call subject to, to the uh, constraints and um, callings that God gives us in his providence. And, th- and there's nothing wrong about that, but that's, that's the way in which he's called us to serve him and to live. Uh, again, that, that's not to warrant any kind of timidity. Um, but at the same time, it also means that we, we, we can't be shouldering a burden that God hasn't laid on it. So those would be a few thoughts. So, so, so you would just say that Paul is expressing that I, that God would use me as an instrument mm-hmm. to save some. Yes. I mean, so the only way to get that would be, you know, filtering that through the rest of Paul rather than mm-hmm. you, any, you rip any verse out of context so you can assume what, right. what's wrong. But you have to just filter that through. Yes. You know, because Paul, I mean, Paul will say something very similar to Timothy. Uh, you, you know, by this you will save both yourself and your hearers. But, but it's clear, Timothy is in view as, as an instrument of the Word of God. And so what, what Paul means is that you will be the one who brings the Word by which God is pleased to save his people. And that connection wouldn't necessarily be understood. Exactly. So I, I think you, you've got something very similar going on here. Good. Good. So uh, it, what, what we're seeing is that Paul did not, in view, did not envisage this uh, full restoration uh, to, to take place in the course of his earthly ministry. He, he is looking to some. He is, uh, of course, evangelizing the Jew. He is an instrument of jeal- provoking to jealousy, but he is not the one through whom this will all come together in fullness. Now, I think this gets confirmed when we look down at verse 15. If their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what is their acceptance except life from the dead? So the first part is clear enough. Their rejection has occasioned the reconciliation of the world, that is, reconciliation through Christ of all kinds of peoples. What is their acceptance except life from the dead? So he, here this acceptance is the, uh, the, the positive response of Israel to the gospel at, at this point in the future. And Paul calls that life from the dead. So what does this mean? Some have taken this literally to refer to the bodily resurrection of the dead when Christ returns at the end of the age. And others have taken this to be metaphorical. Uh, That is to refer to the new life in Christ that's given when a person is united with Christ. And uh, Mu will give you uh, a good defense of the, the literal understanding so that on, on Mu's construction of things, what Paul is describing is something that, that will take place en masse at the return of Christ at the end of the age. If we take this, however, metaphorically, then Paul is not limiting this or restricting this to any particular period in history it leaves that question open. So let's, let's briefly think about the, the pros and cons uh, for each position. And I'm, I've, I've gone back and forth, but I do fall with the, the, the metaphorical understanding of, of this verse. But let's, let's look at each. What's the case for the literal? Well, the case for the literal argues that ek nekron, from the dead, When this phrase occurs in the New Testament, almost always refers to bodily resurrection, consummate resurrection life. 
So <clears throat> Paul then is thinking of the full number of Gentiles being saved to, to draw Paul's words from 1125. And then Israel will be accepted. The full number the, or the totality of Israel will be accepted. So that's, that's the sequence that Mu argues and, and he appeals to the fact that Echnikron is almost always in the New Testament used of bodily resurrection. So uh, the, the picture... Well, I don't know that he's going to argue for every single Israel, um, but he, he is going to argue that there will be, a, 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 at the end of history, a, a massive conversion of Israelites um, concentrated just prior to the return of Christ. So the, the, let, let me paint the, the timetable as, as Moose sees it. We, we, have, we have Israel's trespass and rejection, first century, that triggers, in, in this stage of redemptive history, the uh, incoming of the Gentiles into the people of God. That will, will reach its fullness. We have the fullness of the Gentiles, 1125, which, which Mu takes to be the full number of Gentile elect. That is prompted, 1115. That will prompt, rather, the... Um, the incoming, the ingathering of Israel and conversion en masse, which will be at the time of the bodily resurrection and the return of Christ. So that, that's the sequence as, as Mu paints it. So this great gospel work will be concentrated in time and fall at the end of history. Yes. Yeah, and I think you raise a great point that, um, you know, I think sometimes we bring an assumption to this passage that if, if something large scale is going on, that of course we're going to see it. But that often has not been true in redemptive history. As some of God's greatest works have not been either visible or, or universally visible. And I, that's something I think we need to hold before us as we go through yeah. this passage. To the contrary, you know about the mass conversion of the Muslims at all? Through information. And it was, you read mm -hmm. about that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, I heard it by, by Christian, but not, not as a, it, uh, a missionary could come to right now <coughs> since he, he, he's uh, from, uh, from Russia or from uh, Israel, if he, he sounds I'm just saying, I'm just saying you, you heard about it, right? Like, one of the objections is, uh, for the whole mass conversion of the Jews, is that that puts a precondition on the return of Christ, which in Thessalonians, Paul says, he will come like a thief in the night. And this yeah, is that, that's what things. I wanted to say. Yeah, it yeah. may well be happening here. Or it could be, the, like I said. But it's, it's not a, a thief in the night if you know about it. <laughs> not a thief in the night. But as a joke, I said, we're in the last hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The question for me, um, how we approach this passage, I'm wondering, you know, mm -hmm. we, do we look at other passages in scripture that talk, that talk mm -hmm. about this, or is this sort of something unique to this part of Romans, and then it reminds yeah. me sort of of Revelation 20, and how mm -hmm. people are interpreting that, yeah. and look at the rest of what scripture plays into that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you, you do have broader... Um, in Paul, probably the other passage to bring in uh, would, would be 2 Thessalonians 2, in which he is talking about the appearance and activity of the man of sin, uh, which, um, th I mean, that would carry, that would require a lot of time to walk through. Um, but it's it sometimes said, well, or the objection is that, it, look, if there are, if Paul mentions signs, 
prior to the coming of Christ, then how do we square that with the fact that Christ is going to come like a thief in the night, imminently? And, and I think one, the way we navigate through that, you have the same thing in Jesus. He, he will speak of imminence, and he will also speak of certain things that happened before. And I think the, the way to navigate through that is when Christ returns, then we will know for sure that those things have happened. Uh, in other words, there, there are just some works of God that, are, that only become clear in the light of hindsight, and retrospectively. So I don't think that what the Scripture is telling us to do is look out for these signs, and if you don't see them, then don't worry about Jesus coming back anytime soon. I, I think, no, that the, the focus is on imminence, and um, that when he does come back, then we will know that these things have taken place. We, we may see them, we may not see them, but it doesn't take anything away from all the, the urgency of uh, Christ's return. So, uh, now the alternate view, uh, which is ably defended by Murray, he points to a parallel expression in Romans 6.13. In, in 11.15, we have life from the dead. In Romans 6.13, we have alive from the dead which is used to refer to believers in the here and now. And what that does is to give us a parallel with Paul's description of a believer who is made alive in Christ presently, which uh, inclines us to take the phrase life from the dead to refer to uh, the work of grace by which a person uh, in union with Christ, is brought from dead, uh, death to life. Further, Murray also notes that when Paul wants to talk about bodily resurrection, he usually uses the phrase resurrection from the dead, not life from the dead. So were Paul to be referring to bodily resurrection, we would expect him to use a different phrase than he uses here in verse 15. Uh, and both of those, I think, uh, together are strong considerations for taking this, not of the bodily resurrection, but of the resurrection life that one enters into upon uh, the new birth. So, uh, I think then what Paul is saying is that the, uh, what Paul calls the uh, the acceptance or reception is life from the dead. That is, Paul is defining their acceptance in terms of their coming to faith in Christ. And he is not saying anything further about when this will happen. He, he has hinted that this reception will mean the uh, totality of Israel full reception of Israel. So there is a, a, a strong quantitative sense to the term, but Paul is not concerned to uh, pinpoint its time. Yes? Yeah, he says, what is their acceptance except life from the dead. So what do I mean, Paul says, when I speak of their acceptance? Well, I mean life from the dead. That is, they're going to be brought to faith in Christ. That's what I mean by their acceptance. So that was only possible because of the, their re rejection that brought reconciliation. Yeah, that, that in God's purpose, this, this grant of life, which Paul calls acceptance, follows their, their rejection through unbelief, and, and the Gentile inclusion of faith and provocation to jealousy. Yes. And uh, as Murray notes, if you can possibly read my scratch on the top of 93, or you can just consult his comment on volume two, page 79, he, 
he stresses that the fullness of Israel will involve for the Gentiles a much greater enjoyment of gospel blessing than that occasioned by Israel's unbelief. A gospel blessing far surpassing anything experienced during the period of Israel's apostasy occasioned by the conversion of Israel on a scale commensurate with earlier disobedience. I think that's what I wrote. But read Murray. Um, <clears throat> so that, that is what Paul has, has in view here. Now this brings us uh, to, to the point where Paul, and we won't say anything further on this, 1116 to 1124, the olive tree metaphor. This is where Paul talks about in the course of redemptive history, the, the engrafting and the breaking off of individuals uh, through, by unbelief and through faith, the, the one tree, the one stock, which uh, the, the root Paul stresses is the patriarchs. And then in verses 25 and following, Paul brings all the, of this to a close. And that's, that's where we're going to look now. So Paul says, I, want, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of this mystery, that you might not be wise among yourselves, that a hardening in part has come about on Israel until the, the pleroma, the full number or fullness of Gentiles comes in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Redeemer will come from Zion. He will turn ungodliness from Jacob and this is my covenant to them when I forgive their sins. Uh, quoting Isaiah 59, 20 and 21. Now, what is Paul saying here? And the first thing to see is that he, he introduces his words by saying this is a mystery, a mysterion. A word we've noted before, a word that he uses in chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. And what Paul is, is referring to, mystery has two components. It is, it is a work of God, and it is a work of God that he makes known by special revelation. Uh, a matter that was not made known uh, otherwise or on other occasions. So, so mystery is, this is not uh, mystery in the sense of a mystery novel, a detective story, and Paul is giving you the great conclusion, but rather he is speaking of a work of God, <clears throat> a work of God and made known by God. Yes? I mean, I've heard it contrasted in mystery in our language is a, dedu a deducible mm -hmm. fact versus mm -hmm. mystery in biblical language is an undeducible fact. Yeah, that's right. Because in, in theory, in a mystery story, you should be, I've, I've never been able to solve the crime. Um, but in theory, you should be able to. All the information's there. But on the contrary, here, the information is not there. And what God is giving you, and it's not just information. It's, it's God working and God revealing uh, what he has done. But you couldn't deduce that from anything in the creation. Uh, you, that, that's only known because God has made it known. Yes. So, uh, turning then to the mystery, what is the mystery? And, and that's the, the burden of verses 25 and 26. Paul says in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. Well, that's not the mystery, but the mystery is all Israel will be saved along these lines. Um, hardening, the hardening in part, Gentile inclusion, and then the salvation of all Israel. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. The, the Mysterian, we begin with the hardening in part. So now Paul is stressing that the hardening of Israel, which has occupied Paul through these three chapters, which has, has meant riches for the world, riches for the Gentiles, reconciliation of the world, that's 11, 12, 11, 15, is partial, which is to say it is temporary. 
And that hardening will continue until, Paul says, the, the full number of Gentiles comes in. Until the full number of Gentile elect come to faith in Christ. Yes. Yes, it, it's I temporal. No, I think most m- most commentators are going to take it temporally, uh, a hardening in part. Uh, that is to say, it's. Uh, It's temporary in duration, partial. But I I think, you know, you you don't want to press the difference between the two because there isn't, there's a radical difference between those those two options. Um, It it is partial in the sense that, of course, not all Israel is hardened, but by the same time, it's, it's also temporary because this will only continue until such time as what Paul describes in verse 25. So this, this uh, state of affairs extends, Paul says, to verse 25 uh, until the, the, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then Paul says, and so all Israel will be saved. And so all Israel will be saved. So well, let's break this down. For, firstly, what does Paul mean by all Israel? And, and there have been three or four options that, that we can survey. Firstly, uh, of course, the venerable interpretation of both Augustine and Calvin that Paul is, is referring here to the visible church Jew and Gentile. Uh, the, the difficulty with this view, and it's a view we're going to come back to, or, or a, a, an observation we'll come back to, is that Israel throughout Romans 9 to 11 refers to ethnic Israel. And it has that meaning as recently as verse 25. So this interpretation would involve changing the meaning of Israel from verse 25, a hardening has come about in part on Israel. Well, that's ethnic Israel. But in verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. Well, Israel means something different. It means the visible church. And uh, unless there were some contextual indicator, we wouldn't wouldn't be inclined to make that, that jump. A little closer would would be the view uh, that's adopted by Ritterboss and Hendrickson, elect Jews. Again, uh, this is better in in that we're we're now talking about Jewish ethnicity. But again, you're still left with the problem that verse 25 Israel, verse 26 Israel are slightly different where Israel in verse 25 refers to Israel as a whole, verse 26, Israel is referring specifically to elect Israelites. Um, The the 19th century commentator Meyer argued that what Paul is referring to are all Israelites who happen to be alive when Christ returns. Now, that... I think there are two, two objections to that. One is that that assumes that what Paul is describing will, will take place at the return of Christ. And it also uh, argues something that Paul does not elsewhere argue, namely that all Israelites who are alive at the return of Christ will, will be saved. And again, uh, Paul says all Israel, but not every Israelite. And those would be two different things. The, the best view, I think, and, and no view is without difficulties, but the best view, it's, it's adopted by Hodge, Murray, and Mu, uh, which is to say Israel in verse 26 refers to the nation, 
qua nation, the nation as the nation of Israel. Now, th this is where I think the Ritterboss and Hendrickson view is, is very close, e even as it's a different view. If we ask the question, what is the composition of that nation? Of course, elect persons. But Paul's concern is, remember to stress the, the totality of Israel. Uh, she, there is presently a lack, and he wants to stress that there will be a fullness. So, so the emphasis is not put on the elect persons who make up this body, though that is who they are, but the emphasis is put on who they are in aggregate as a whole. Now, I think that the, what commends this view is that it, it preserves the sense of Israel as Paul has used it throughout Romans 9 to 11 as the nation. It does not commit us to the conversion of every Israelite. But rather what Paul is describing is that there will be a great gospel work between the apostleship of Paul and the return of Christ at some point in between. There will be a great gospel work in which many Israelites come to faith and we can say, verse 26, that all Israel will be saved. Again, uh, Murray, uh, the way he describes it, I think is helpful. Uh, what's in view is the restoration of Israel to gospel favor and blessing, the correlative turning of Israel from unbelief to faith and repentance. That on a scale that is commensurate with their trespass, their loss, their casting away, their breaking off, their hardening, commensurate, of course, in the opposite direction. Um, two questions. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Hokma, uh, what position he takes out of, out of those four? Mm. <coughs> I have a dim recollection, yeah. and I'm, it probably would be just as well not to say it, but I, I have a dim recollection. He either goes with Calvin or Ritterboss, Hendrickson. I would have to go back and look. Yeah. I think he agrees with Ritterboss. Again, I would have to go back and look. I know he discusses it. I know he discusses it. Now, yeah. in the context of mm -hmm. um, the modern day, mm -hmm. how would you define an ethnic Jew mm -hmm. in relation to this text? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that raises a practical question. Um, not least because of intermarrying and, and so on. And, um, you, you know, I, I don't think that, that Paul is, is thinking of an Israelite in terms of someone who says he's an Israelite or just claims some attachment uh, to, to Judaism, um, but in the sense that they would be sufficiently Israelite as not to be a Gentile. And... I think this is one of those circumstances where um, we'll, we'll, we'll see the particulars in hindsight. Um, and, and that would be one consideration to me why this is not a program for evangelistic strategy. Well, you know, let's, I mean, we should evangelize Jewish people, but then who are the Jewish people? And we have to do a DNA test to find out. Uh, it's like Spurgeon would say, you know, tell me who are all the select people, mark them with a piece of chalk, and I'll go preach to them. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think we, we need to distinguish what God has said he is going to do in redemptive history from what he has called and commanded us to do in Scripture. And uh, th this is descriptive of the work of God as we take up the call to preach the gospel to Jew and Gentile. To all nations. To all nations. That's right. That's right. Yes. I'm not quite sure I understand uh, quite the nuance between the position of Hajimari Bu mm -hmm. and, and then Rotterdam. Because we're, I understand you're saying the whole nation of Israel has the nation, it's about the, right. the, the, the global thing. And yet we're saying that, yes, of course, who does it consist of? We're talking about the elect, mm -hmm. which is what Rotterdam is saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure how. Not quite clear on the, on the nuance between the two, besides of what I just said, or how 
your criticism of Ritterbaugh's Heinrich Kurtz position then doesn't automatically apply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To yeah, that, you know, it, it would be the difference between talking about a team and the members of a team. And uh, if, if Paul has been saying such and so for three chapters about the team, then our presumption is that the, the, the word that's used subsequently will refer to the team. Now, of course, you, you can't conceive a team without members, players. But that would be a different thing to say. Now, all of a sudden, the word that Paul has been using of the team is now referring to the individual players. So I, it, it's really a, a it, it is a fine objection, it, refined objection, in that it, it involves a, enough of a lexical shift to at least prompt doubt that uh, that, that would be the, the best way to explain it. But in a sense, because, you know, to carry the analogy, you, you can't conceive a team independently of its, of its members, even as you can speak of a team distinct from its players, um, then you, you really end up affirming what Ritterboss and Hendrickson are concerned to affirm, even if you demur from the particular lexical option that they've gone for. So I recognize it's refined. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the fourth position, would you mm -hmm. argue that this the big work uh, of the spirit uh, will happen after the last day does mm -hmm. as a change to faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a mass uh, conversion at the end of the Yes, and, and that that's what I'm getting to at this point. Um, it, it could allow that, that, taking all Israel as the nation could allow that, but it doesn't, because that's where Mu goes. But I don't think it requires it. So, so the kai hutos, in, in most instances in Paul, means and in this way, and in this way. So, so what, I think what Paul seems to be saying is this. He's, he's not drawing the, a strict chronological sequence, hardening of Israel, fullness of Gentiles, salvation of all Israel. What he's saying is, how is it that, that, the, that all Israel will be saved? How, how's God going to do that? That's the kai hutos. Well, the way he's going to do it, verse 25, is, is this way. There, there is to begin the hardening in part on Israel, and, and that hardening is going to continue. And then there will be the, the, the full number of the Gentiles. And when the full number of Gentiles have come in, then at that point, you'll look around and you will see that all Israel has been saved. So what Paul is describing then, I think, is a, a twofold reality that will take place across redemptive history, namely that uh, Jews and Gentiles will be saved in, uh, in totality, in full number, such that at the end of redemptive history, uh, we'll look back and we will say, here is the full fullness of Gentiles and here is all Israel. They have been saved. Yes? How do you take um, in Galatians 6.16, mm -hmm. you know, do you see that as inclusive as, of Gentiles when it's speaking of mm -hmm. Israel? Do you see that inclusive of Gentiles mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. in that context? And oh. How, how might that relate to... You mean the, the, the grace, mercy, and peace? Yeah. Um, you mean you haven't read the Galatians piece and the footnote in which that was discussed? Oh, great. I'm Sorry. so hurt. No, I think you've got to take the chi as, uh, you, you can't take it as and, but even. Okay. So he would be calling the church Israel. Right. Because after five and a half chapters, for Paul to turn around and say, oh, grace, mercy, and peace to these unbelieving Israelites would just unravel the whole argument. So I, I think he's got to be speaking here of the church who is the Israel of God. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I will read the... Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I just, just wanted yes. to clarify about uh, Romans 11. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, the fourth shema number four mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. Israel is about is from the, uh, the old nation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not necessarily specific in time like the... Uh, mm -hmm. 
end time uh, mm -hmm. or the right. tell when Christ will mm -hmm. come back. Yes. So, so what Paul is saying is that be, between, between the first century and the return of Christ, there will be a great gospel work among Gentiles and among Jews. He, he does not specify in, in the, the specific time. He, he doesn't limit it to the return of Christ. He, he does say it will, it will fall out according to this pattern, hardening in part on Israel, and then the bringing in of Gentiles, and that provokes Israel to jealousy, which in turn uh, will be the occasion for God to save Israelites. And I, I think the point, the main point of Romans 9 to 11 is that as, as from where Paul stands, he, he sees fullness and not, uh, uh, and, and, and not emptiness as he surveys the prospective work of the gospel. So when we get to the end of, of redemptive history, there, there will be fullness of, of Jew and of Gentile. And this is the way in which God is going to do it. But I think in terms of laying out a specific program uh, or, or indicating that this will happen at such and so a period of time, I don't think he's concerned to do it. His main concern is to say, look, the, the, the hardening and unbelief that we see in Israel is not the last word. God has, God has a, a large number of uh, elect Israelites, and they will be brought to faith, such that at the end of redemptive history, we'll be able to look back and say, God has saved all Israel. So this could be a process going on right now? And yes. I mean, oh, I, I fully expect that, so. That's Hukuma's point, actually. Yes. And, yeah, I just found the, the, oh. the relevant passage. Yes. It says, National Israel will be saved, but not in a, in a national, sorry, Israel will be saved, not in a national or climactic sense. It says, Jews will continue to be converted to Christianity throughout the entire era between the first and second mm -hmm. comings of Christ, as the full numbers of the Gentile is being gathered in. In such Jewish conversions, therefore, we are to see a sign of the certainty of Christ's return. In the meantime, this sign should bind on our hearts the urgency of the church's mission to the Jews. In a world in which there is still a great deal of anti-Semitism, let us not forget that God has not rejected his ancient covenant people, and he still has his purpose for this. Exactly. So it's, it is that, that concept that there will be salvation to, is, to, to those of Israel, but it's not in a sort of eschatological sense uh, beyond the this present, the, right. the, the final age, the, yes. these times that we're living in. Yes. So whereas the post-millennialist says that there's going to be this massive sort of, that things are getting better and better and better, mm -hmm. and will be visibly getting better and better. Mm -hmm. This is saying this could, this could be ongoing right now. Yes. And, and, and in hindsight, we look back and say, oh, look, mm -hmm. you know, look at what God has done. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, Paul insists the gospel is to the Jew first and to the Greek. So you don't, you don't say, well, because the Jew is rejected, we're, we're not going to deal with you anymore. <laughs> Moving on to the Gentiles. And then I think what, what comes out of this is that Paul has a tremendous gospel optimism. Yeah that this is the way history is going to, to end, in fullness. There will be a full redeemed humanity. And uh, we labor on, even, even as Paul in his own day faced many discouragements, particularly among the Jews. He continued to preach to the Jew, confident that this was going to be the outcome. And I think you know, we apply that to ourselves. It's okay, it's a day of small things, but God has the fullness of his people, Jew and Gentile. And, and there will be a redeemed humanity, not a man here, plucked here and there, but a redeemed humanity that uh, Christ will bring to himself on the day of judgment. And as we preach and preach this to the church today, mm -hmm. I think one of the encouraging things, especially for us in Canada, where we see little fruit, does not mean that God's purposes mm -hmm. are not being fulfilled through us and yes. around the world in, in great measure. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we sort of have this view of God's sovereignty and God's power through the lens of our own experience. Mm -hmm. it's, it's far broader than this. And exactly. Luke is bringing, or Luke, sorry, mm -hmm. Paul is bringing a broader perspective. That's right. That's exactly right. Yes. I'm having a hard time. Like, would we, would we not consider someone who holds that view as, as mm -hmm. super cessationist? Or like, do you still see mm -hmm. a division? Or? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there there is a sense in which you know, a Jew remains a Jew, because I, Paul, I think, is thinking here of, of, of a person ethnically, and, and there's no 
There's no sense in which they, they have a seat in first class in the people of God. Um, and and the, the whole reason that Paul is dividing humanity along the line of Jew and Gentile is because of what, what's been happening in redemptive history in, in the first century. And re really Paul's concern is to say in, in 11, 25, and 26, you know, it's not as though when we get, when Christ returns, we're going to have a, a full Gentile humanity and a couple of Israelites. But we're going to have a full human, redeemed humanity, uh, which will be Israelite and Gentile, such that we can look on it and say that there's a fullness of Israel, there's a fullness of Gentiles. And, and it's in part to vindicate uh, the word of God, it has not failed, uh, that he has good and gracious purposes remaining for, for sinners, including Israelites. And uh, I think that's really the burden here. So, yes, the, the, the Jew remains in the purpose of God as the Gentile remains in the purpose of God, but not as though there's some special privileged position uh, for them in the way that, say, dispensationalist interpreters have argued. Um, I, I don't think that means that, uh, I, th I don't think that brings us to, to the play, and supersessionism is, it, it's a charged word, it, you, you hear it, but it's, uh, is this supersessionist, well, not if you're saying that the Jew is beyond the reach of the gospel, not if you're saying that the Jew has as much a place in the people of God as, as anyone else does. Yeah. And, you know, again, remember where he goes, verse 32, God has shut up all um, to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. So anything that God is doing, as Paul is describing it here, is mercy. It's undeserved. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but I so, I so love uh, mm -hmm. this passage, mm. and uh, I'm really excited because uh, when I read the uh, option number 40, mm -hmm. Bible's interpretation mm -hmm. that was exactly the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but well, this whole thing reminds me of unconditional election. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen in, in, in history that, generally speaking, mm -hmm. God has spread the gospel in, in a fantastic way in the United States, of, let's, let's say, compared to India or place, mm -hmm. remote places like sure. that. So if God wants to power up, power his grace mm -hmm. on the nation of Israel mm -hmm. in, in, in a time, he can do it, he's sovereign. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that gets me really excited because we accept that only by faith. <laughs> we not see it, mm -hmm. but we accept that by faith because God is saying that it will happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we just should accept it like it is written mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, remind us that um, no one deserves to be saved, but yes. God can do whatever he wants and if he wants to power his grace on an entire nation, mm -hmm. uh, like, like you said, massive conversion, not, not specifically every individual is mm -hmm. right, but as a whole, mm -hmm. like he has done uh, in some places throughout history, like Great Awakening mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that can do it. Sure. And uh, would, would God be free to save Israel, uh, Israelites en masse, of course? Would he be free to do so at the end of history? Of course. But uh, is, is Paul saying that that is the way that God has said he will do it? I, I don't think so. He's free to. He may. But I think uh, Paul is not concerned to uh, speak to those details, only to say, friends, here's the outcome. Full Israel, full Gentiles, and uh, there, there's no question but that we're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another way to paraphrase is no one will be missing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Amen, bro. That's right. Amen. L let, me, let me round out by just making a comment or two about <laughs> the, the quotation from Isaiah 59, here in verse 26 and 27. Uh, the Redeemer will come from Zion. He will turn ungodliness from Jacob. This will be my covenant uh, with them that I will forgive their sins. Now, <clears throat> at first glance, 
it may seem that Paul is speaking of the return of Christ at the end of the age. <clears throat> the Redeemer will come from Zion. <clears throat> uh, the, the problem, though, is that what follows, turning on, on godliness from Jacob, covenant, forgiving sins, would come after the return of Christ. And there, there's just no indication elsewhere in Paul that, that those are things that would follow the return of Christ or necessarily attend the return of Christ. But I think uh, the, the, if, if we take Zion and, and Mu, interestingly and correctly, I think, argues that the Zion is, is the heavenly Zion, uh, Hebrews 12, 22, then this would be a reference not to the second coming, but to the first coming of Christ. And this, the quotation would, would first say, speak of the, the incarnation of Christ, and then would describe in, at the end of 26 and 27 what it is that Christ would do in the course of his earthly ministry uh, and specifically between his resurrection and his return. And the reason that Paul cites this passage and the, the reason that he cites it in this connection is that Paul is linking the extension of gospel mercies, cited here in this quotation, with the ministry of Christ and the extension of gospel ministry, uh, mercies to Israel. So how is it Paul can, can say, uh, thus it is written, because he says, look, here's Isaiah 59, and it says that the Lord Jesus Christ will have mercy, gospel mercy, on Jacob. And then verses 28 to 32 reminds us that it's really Paul exhorting and applying what he has just said. <clears throat> he said, uh, though, uh, though they are your enemies for the gospel's sake, according to election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. That is, Paul is, is warning the church in Rome not to write off the Israelites, not to ignore them. But rather, he says, uh, moving down to verse 32, God has shut up all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. So as God was patient with you, verse 30, for formerly you were disobedient to God, and now you were shown mercy uh, by their unbelief. Uh, so also these now have um, been unbelieving in the face of your mercy uh, in order that even they will be shown mercy. So this is a plea to the church not to write Israel off, not to cease gospel endeavor to Israel, not an evangelistic program, uh, do, do such and so in this order, but a plea not to write them off. But as God showed mercy on you, then uh, pray and labor that God may show mercy on them. And then that brings us to the, uh, the doxology, uh, f f where we started where uh, Paul uh, resolves everything to the riches of divine mercy and the wisdom and the understanding of God and then ascribes all glory eternally to God. Amen. That's where Paul ended, and I think that's where I'm going to end too. <laughs> any, any questions, thoughts before we, we wrap up here? Yes. Mm -hmm. As far as, I mean, at face value, one, one I think, could, could say that Israel as it stands today bears right. no correlation. I mean, yes. little to no correlation. I mean, ethnically, geographically, there's mm -hmm. some overlap. But as far as the borders of where Israel was, the country as it was established as God's covenant people are just, they're just mm -hmm. not a <coughs> Yes. have to say about as far as... Is there, I mean, there's, there's not zero correlation because there's still some bloodlines, mm -hmm. you know, 164, whatever yeah. that is. 
What would you comment on? Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be a mistake of the first order to identify the modern nation state of Israel with Israel in this passage, and that we should treat the nation of Israel no better, no worse than we would treat any other nation. Right. But they are, they are not privileged or set apart in the purposes of God because of anything Paul says here. Um, that, that at, least, at least in the U.S., that's a, a fairly easy slip uh, to identify modern Israel with this Israel. I think we've got to stress that, no, 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 they're, uh, they're, they're different things. They're different things. It's been more or less stressed by foreign policy since 49. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and you, you couldn't appeal to passages like this uh, to inform foreign policy towards that particular nation. I just don't think that, that, that is at all a, a right reading of the passage. Good. But God, God knows who they are, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Of course, exactly. Mm -hmm. Some think they are and they are not. It's some don't think they are and they are. Some collection of views globally mm -hmm. are bloodline. Can you see on Quebec? <laughs> but what, what, what mm -hmm. is the view that you uh, mm -hmm. promote? Amen, brother. The fact that it's compatible with uh, the ministry of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a program or strategy. Yeah, but, but, but Paul's ministry is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Else, how do we understand the heart of the Jews and the fact that you want Yeah, that's right. It would be like different things that are not Yeah, that's right. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, Brother Raymond, may I ask you to close this in prayer? Thank you to bless his return.